Welcome, Welcome to the Ministries Podcast. Today, we continue the discussion on healing through the pain, a tribute to PTSD Awareness Month. I am joined with Louis Crew, author of the book, Acclimatic Restorative Coaching, Solving Media Overload. Thank you, Louis. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. No problem. You know, I just... I welcome anyone who comes as a guest because it's nerve wracking. You know, you're, you're like <laughs> you're sharing stuff that maybe, you know, it's 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 all subjective. What you're sharing, how how personal that may look to you. But I do find the dialogue needs to continue to happen. <laughs> and I just want to say welcome, Louie, and thank, thank you for sharing your insight with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I leave you open and uh, I absolutely love the topic. Love it. It's funny, you know, when we talk about tributes, it's always about remembering, and we're so bad at remembering. But Mm -hmm. disclaimer before we begin, those who are in the U.S., I always love putting the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you are in the U.S. and you're in crisis, it's 1-800-273-8255. But I know there's people outside of the United States who are listening. I encourage you to find what is available in your area. I just want to share, you know, obviously we're talking about PTSD, but it's amazing just how the view of trauma was just about 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. I was looking this up and it said the PTSD was filled, was an important gap of psychiatry that causes the result that it was caused by event in which individuals suffered rather than personal weakness, which I find kind of tends to kind of under, is an undertone of the discussion. You know, a lot of times when we think about trauma, it never gets addressed because there's a lot of enoughness, a lot of urgency that we put on ourselves as, as this world continues to go faster, even despite mm-hmm. the fact that a lot of us are stuck at home or working from home. Mm-hmm. And with that being said, you know, uh, I know you are U.S. Air Force veteran. Sure. Yes, sir. Me too. U.S. Oh, Air right. Force. <laughs> there you go. Well, one of my favorite books, uh, authors is Ernest Hemingway and Farewell to Arms. I thought this was very telling, this excerpt. He says, um, who is that on the in the trenches by your side? And does it matter? And I love what he responds, more than the war itself. And I mm. feel that's where we're diving in. What comes to mind when you hear that? Why is the people in our trenches more important than the war itself? I, mean, uh, I, I, I think that's, that's a powerful question. I absolutely love it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's... Uh, our psychosocial network, the people mm. around us, our friends and our family understand us and our quirks and our, our uh, peculiarities better than anyone. You know, yeah. uh, sometimes we can uh, go to seek uh, help from somebody and they'll be mm. wonderful. Mm. But uh, with a family member or a friend, uh, one little gesture can tell an entire story and they, yeah. they know how to rush by your side and and help you, you know, which is beautiful. Not everybody has that though. <laughs> um, and uh, some people don't have family by their sides or friends by their sides. And and that's when, you know, I, I really, I think it helps to turn to God. I think it helps to, yeah. um, to, to turn to that inner beauty inside of us. I mean, if you think about it, PTSD is a defense mechanism mm-hmm. and um, what is it trying to defend? Mm-hmm. Obviously, if there's a defense mechanism, there must be something really beautiful and powerful inside that it's trying to protect. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think uh, connecting with that is important. You know, well, the one constant in life is change. You know, I, I think with my faith, at least for me, God is the one thing that doesn't change. And it is kind mm-hmm. of comforting that about that. One thing I want to share is recovery looks different for everyone. Let's just mm-hmm. let's throw that out there because mm-hmm. I know people with PTSD. I suffer from PTSD. That some treatments work, some don't. You know, right. and, and it just depends. I always say uh, say that there are things or events that you can't change. Maybe you can't change at this moment, but mm-hmm. however, there are also things that we can make small changes towards in our recovery. Mm-hmm. A lot of Harry Potter fans, no friends, uh, fans, no J.K. Rowling, of course. But one of the quotes that I love that she writes is that numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. Right. Um. And isn't that interesting? Because that is the definition of PTSD. Yeah. PTSD is avoidance. 
Yeah. Um, and, and it's, um, yeah, that's, that's powerfully written. I understand she went through a very traumatic time herself Yeah, and book, uh, the book that she wrote was kind of an expression of post-traumatic growth, Yeah, uh, which is, which is beautiful. It, it is a lot of times through a lot of, um, different c- circumstances, but through the pain, some of the most creative things come out, you know, and some mm-hmm. of the creative, um, um, I don't know, for me, it's, um, it's powerful. This, this statement right here, but also you're here, you written a book. It's called acclimatic restorative coaching. Service. Right. Yeah. Solving right. media overload. <laughs> it's, <little> it's, uh, <laughs> um, I just want to share with those. Um, I'm going to ask you, you wrote a book. A lot of people write books. Mm-hmm. What message, what message do you hope people reading it will get out of it? And uh, what prompted you to write it in the first place? Um, well, um, if you don't mind, I'll ask the second question first. Okay. <laughs> uh, in uh, I, it started in the United States Air Force in 1991, mm-hmm. um, and I was eventually deployed to the Middle East. I was deployed yeah. to Saudi Arabia, where we had to enforce the no-fly zone over Iraq. Mm-hmm. And um, during that time in that region, it was very violent. I'm not sure how much things have changed since then, but it was it was very violent. And in Saudi Arabia, a lot of the people who uh, worked within the nation came from neighboring Middle Eastern nations who were upset about our presence there. Yeah. So to help maintain control of the people, uh, the Saudi government, the royal family at the time, um, uh, decided to weaponize information against their own people. They would yeah. use shock to get people's attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and if this this is a tr- uh, trigger warning, I'm going to talk about some negative <laughs> things. So yeah. Um, and if you call that number uh, that that you mentioned earlier, uh, you press one if you're a vet. So yeah. uh, and and that's that's great. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there was uh, surrounded by rhetoric. These people, they were immersed in it as if they were immersed in a swimming pool, as mm-hmm. if you know you're surrounded by water. Um, they were surrounded by information and uh, there were regular warnings of uh, signs posted publicly that parts of your body could be dismembered. There were uh, beheadings twice a week in the nation. Um, uh, women would be stoned to death uh, if they were uh, seen as committing adultery, even if they hadn't. Um, and, and if, they had. I mean, please. The, mm-hmm. There's no reason for for any of that. Yes. And it really made things horrible. So uh, when I came back to the states, mm-hmm. uh, and I eventually re-entered civilian life, I entered the career field that I saw as an extension of military service and a way mm-hmm. to ensure that this never became another Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. And that was working in TV news. Yeah, um, I worked in TV news for 23 years. Uh, mm-hmm. I worked for affiliates of every network. I also composed music for network television and cable and things like that. And my career was going strong until I ended up at a station, uh, unwittingly accepted a job at a station mm-hmm. uh, that was focused more on shock than mm-hmm. actually informing the public. And um it, it, it was loaded with rhetoric. People lost their connection between reality and mm-hmm. language. Um, and that gave the power to the most skilled rhetoricians. Mm-hmm. So if yeah. they could say something colorfully, everybody mm-hmm. believed it. And that triggered in me several things. Um, first of all, it, it triggered panic in me because I was afraid. I saw what overexposure to weaponized information could do to people at home. Mm -hmm. And um, in Saudi Arabia, and I was afraid that it would happen here. So that awoke in me or had awakened in me this this uh, PTSD Mm -hmm. uh, response. Um, And also, uh, as science has been discovering, uh, overexposure to such information is dangerous in the first place. Yeah. Uh, In fact, they found that uh, if you consume six or more hours of traumatic news per day, Mm-hmm. You're 900 percent more likely to develop post-traumatic stress symptoms than if you were at the actual traumatic event itself. Yeah. Um, so, uh, because of all this, I fought behind the scenes for them to to soften the content, make it informative uh, and not as harmful. Uh, they agreed or partially agreed. They went along with it. Some changes were made, 
And then I uh, created Acclimatic Restorative Coaching. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the world's first life coaching or talk therapy technique that was created from inside the news media looking out rather than the outside looking in. I see. So, so the book explains all the techniques that are used behind the scenes to uh, create uh, shock news and, you know, the journalism that we grew up with before the Internet blew up to be what it is. <laughs> and uh, and then it teaches about the brain and it also talks about, you know, ways to help people recover. So what I hope people get out of this book and mm -hmm. especially out of this discussion mm is that when we're triggered, as I said earlier, when we're triggered and mm. our defense mechanisms kick in, mm. uh, the reason those defense mechanisms exist in the first place is because there's something beautiful on the inside that it's trying to defend. Yeah. You know, uh, even if you look at the videos of, uh, I won't mention any, any things, but it, even if you look at some of the craziness of, of some of the protests that have happened over the last several years, yeah, they do things that both sides of the political spectrum disagree with. Mm -hmm. But despite those behaviors, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them apologized later, saying, I don't know why I did that. I don't mm -hmm. understand that. And those were our defense mechanisms that kicked in. Yeah. So uh, what I hope people realize first is that there's something beautiful inside of them that the defense mechanisms are trying to protect. Mm -hmm. The next thing is to uh, I hope people learn to uh, listen to, to, to news uh, or social media or overexposure to whatever traumatic information happens to be. Think less about the content. Mm -hmm. Consider more of the structure that was used to create the content mm. because that will help us all understand it was just language yeah it was language so yeah. so like if you're depressed or you're upset or mm -hmm. you know you're mad about this political figure or that political figure and you're really upset well you're not present you're not yeah. here. you're not yeah. in the moment you're not grounded in truth and truth is freeing so yeah. compare that the stuff in your head with your immediate surroundings and see if it holds any weight in reality. And the third thing mm -hmm. I would, I'm sorry if I'm going to, no, long. no, 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 it's good. Yeah. The third thing is, is um, <clears throat> in, uh, in honor of post-traumatic stress disorder awareness month mm -hmm. is to consider rephrasing post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. Look at it instead as post-traumatic stress competency. Mm. right we had gone through something bad yeah we learned to defend ourselves against that something bad yeah competently so now you know today we may have a troop uh buying ice cream for his child car backfires and he drops well you mm. know what he learned to defend himself competently yeah right so the idea now is to understand that as people with ptsd Mm -hmm. diagnosed or undiagnosed mm -hmm. um, the past can and will never happen again mm -hmm. we're here in this moment all that exists is now mm -hmm. that's it you know so so those competencies they may well up every so often and we should just thank them say thank you <laughs> i don't need you right now yeah and, um that's what i hope and i also hope people read the book and learn to find the beauty within themselves yeah you know and and that's what this is all about i the the book is all about identifying that beautiful part of yourself that your defense mechanisms are trying to protect and then reacquainting that happier person with the objective world what's yeah here? you know i i i just want to tell those those who are listening that everything will be in the notes if you guys are interested in finding out more about this book and everything else i just love the idea because i just remember you know thinking about 9 11 that's when i was serving from 2000 to 2004. Thank and I, just, I just remember going in and i wasn't i wasn't even thinking about 9 11. i was 18 years old right out of high school and i just remember just um just, I never like to get polit political, and it's funny that that word political is, is how it is, but mm -hmm. 
the reason is because it's one of those things I see all the time. It's polarizing. Mm -hmm. It's like, if I'm so right, Louis, what does that make you? Right. So wrong. Exactly. So wrong. And exactly. like for me, um, I never find healing when there were that is the case. And I don't know, for me, um, sometimes it's problematic, especially I remember just with, you know, the overconsumption of information that keeps getting flooded in and mm -hmm. then how televised wars have been be have become even more so as of late. And mm -hmm. I just remember um, all it does, like sometimes, you know, like you said, if, you're, if I'm mad, if I'm sad or whatever, I'm just going to build a narrative around whatever my confirmation bias is. Like mm -hmm. if I watch the news, I'm like, I'm angry. Mm hmm. Then I'm just gonna listen to things that are angry that will support my anger. Right. <laughs> right. Well, so the fun, the thing about it is, all it is 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 deflecting. And for me, all I I try, and I think you know, in a way, listening is one of those things that gets overlooked a lot. Actively listening to individuals, understanding, and actively, you know, self awareness is you know is key too in this whole 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 thing because actively listening you kind of i don't listen to the words they say and when i watch the news i listen to the reasons they're saying them mm -hmm. there's a lot of level of urgency and certainty that cannot be actually <laughs> like like in a sense um cannot be that a hundred percent true but a lot of people like you but like we're talking about are are stuck they're stuck at home and you would think with COVID 19 that people would slow down, but it has made things more busy. I hate the word busy because <laughs> all it is is me saying I don't want to answer fifty questions. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of uh, for me, I think the urgency for me is troubling. I, I remember in my groups and support group, obviously, they're like, "I'm watching the news for till four in the morning." I'm like, "Well, you'll be the most informed sick person I know." Right. And that's that is problematic right. because it's a, this level of certainty because I know, like you said, I know the content, mm -hmm. but but honestly, where's your boundaries? Where is your time to breathe or reflect on that? Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that is sometimes uh, a lot of problematic when it comes to PTSD. A lot of people get triggered. And for me, it's I find it with this overconsumption of information. It leads to this certainty that's undeserved. That, 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 right. <laughs> so, right. uh, you, you know, you you had said something. Uh, uh, people will using confirmation biases, yeah, uh, uh, kind of consume the information that complements what what they already believe. Yeah, and then you say, "Well, then you'll be the most informed sick person I've ever known." <laughs> Think about PTSD for a moment. Right? <laughs> the yeah. veteran I mentioned earlier buying his child ice cream, a car mm. backfires, mm. and then uh, and then he drops to the ground, which has nothing mm. to do with ice cream and where he is. It's yeah. a learned defense. So that yeah. means he was already traumatized, mm -hmm. and then it triggered a response. Mm -hmm. So now think about how many people who are politically savvy or maybe politically addicted mm. – um, uh, somebody says something political, it triggers them, and they all speak the same talking points. Yeah. They all yeah. speak the same talking points that somebody else wrote. Yeah. So that means that at the point they're triggered, there's a chance, mm -hmm. a chance that they were mm -hmm. traumatized before the triggering ever happened. Yeah. So so it, it's, it's, uh, I love that topic. You know, and yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's about trying to understand that there's so much more to the world. There's yeah. so much more. And mm. what you're hearing is these days, especially as news organizations try to boost their ratings and trying to mm. pull in more people with shock. Not all news organizations. Yeah. So yeah. Great, great places out there. It was only one station that got me sick and triggered me. Mm. But it's it's uh, which I'm not going to mention. Um, I forgot what I was saying. But but it's it's uh, the shocking the the shock news information or the, the the stations are about trying to grab you and pull you in using shock because yeah. there's a side of us mm. that is designed to look towards dangerous things. There's yeah. a saying behind the scenes, and um, I heard it at the shock news station, and it it appalled me. If you tell someone a tornado is coming from the east, they'll look to the east. Mm -hmm. 
So they're in the business of telling you there are tornadoes coming. So you're always looking in their direction. But that's just a tiny little bit of the fuller reality. There's mm -hmm. so much more. And in fact, if I were to say, even mm -hmm. with COVID, we're living in perhaps the safest time humanity's ever known. Mm -hmm. How would that feel on the inside? Mm -hmm. You know, how, 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 how would that, how would you have to restructure your worldview to accept that? That yeah. even though the media may be saying the world's falling apart, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, I call the information age Babel 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, but even though our electronic world, the mm -hmm. news, or social media, or whatever, is telling us that uh, that things are falling apart, what if it's true that we're living in the safest time humanity's ever known? Yeah, that's true. And mm -hmm. if that's true, well, well, then there's hope. Yeah. And and I think. Um, I think it's all about hope. I, you know, I like that you mentioned hope. You know, safe places are very thing that I try to, I try to. When you go to when when I do a support group, one of the things I try to establish is a safe place model. That mm -hmm. you know, whatever it says here stays here. You know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that's interesting about it is um, setting those boundaries. And having a safe place is vital to healing, at least from my, you know, I know people that I still loosely continue, continue to try to connect, even throughout this COVID. They don't want to do virtual support, which I understand. A lot of mm -hmm. over, like too much on the screen time, all that stuff. But at the same time, connection doesn't mean, social distancing doesn't mean I don't connect with one another. Right. You know? And so I, I still try to connect. And one of the things that I know I'm kind of, um, um, try, uh, I'm gonna skip over because I'm oh, this principal support and NAMI. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump back and forth, but I love this thing. I uh, this this principal support. I looked at it, you know, obviously doing groups over groups over groups as a facilitator. You kind of look at it, get mundane, kind of get complacent. You just read it through like you're as right. a group, but at the same time, I'm looking at everything around me and I'm seeing, you know. A lot of peers just assume that they're burdens a lot of times. A lot of times they either feel like they're a burden or like when this sub principle support has to be written down for them because they're incapable of being effective in supporting one another, which I find is further from the truth because a lot of people who are not peers or peers, it doesn't even matter how struggle with supporting one another. Mm -hmm. a support right now is it's, it's uh, one of the things, at least for me being a peer, and I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but because they witnessed me, you know, going into hospitals, mental health hospitals, all that mm -hmm. stuff, they're like, okay, I don't want Rob to be worse. So they try to embalm me in this static state. But one thing about mindset and the growth and healing, it is not static, it's dynamic. It keeps mm -hmm. changing, keeps growing. So sometimes I couldn't cry. I couldn't mm -hmm. feel anything because if I did, it will make worry my family members and stuff because they think, oh no, Rob's getting worse. Right. But sometimes sometimes those feelings, you know, feelings I always say, especially feelings are good servants, not good masters. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, well, you know? <laughs> I would love to talk about feelings if you don't mind at some point. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Oh uh, well. I want to first go into the support, the, the support methods, and I want your insight because hmm. I find them uniquely interesting. Obviously, there's like a lot, but I'm just picking three of them. This one right here is hard for me for a long time. Mm -hmm. We won't judge anyone's pain as less than our own. What do you mean? <laughs> I've been too worse. You know what I mean? But yeah. I feel that this, for one, allows you to stop focusing on you and start looking outwards. Looking right. at other people and hearing, because I would say the people who bother me the most <laughs> are usually are a reflection of something I don't want to see for myself about right. myself. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Yeah, exactly. And uh, what? Uh, and uh, another thing that I want to say is um, we forgive ourselves and reject guilt. I think for one, we could we could we could be stuck there. You know, we're like I've done something wrong, something in the past that. You, you, and this goes back to value. And then we're talking about value briefly, subtly, but 
if you don't feel that you're valuable enough to be forgiven or your guilt is going to just make you stuck at where you're at, a lot of songs, I know people who are like health enthousi enthusiasts, they're like, oh, you got to run and all this stuff. And it's great. I am inspired by trying to get myself better. But the reason I feel that way, Louis, is because I have more value for myself. If someone has little to no value, they're not going to eat broccoli. They're not going to go on a run. They're not going to care about it because they're not heard. Period. Well, I'm in the fitness protection program. So <laughs> after I got out of the service, I was like, no more exercise for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, guilt is a big thing with, with PTSD. It, is. It, it really is. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was in the service and I saw uh, what was happening to those people and you had mentioned nine 11, mm. uh, Osama bin Laden was a Saudi national. He was one of the, he was, the, I'm sorry. He was the son of a Saudi national. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, information environment in Saudi really affected him. But uh, when I was working in the media for most of my 23 years, I was so proud to be part of truth sharing. So people at home can debate. Sometimes it's ugly. We need all ideas from all political <laughs> ideas, but you know, or all political sides, but uh, they debate and we come to new ideas and then we create something new. When I ended up at that shock news station, um, I felt so much guilt. Yeah. Uh, for all the people at home, I'm like, you know, I'm no longer in the service, but I feel like I need to be back in the service again. So I fought behind the scenes like crazy. And, you know, this is a book. This book is is a result of mm -hmm. wanting the American people to, to feel safe, not to change any political ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't see any political right or wrong here because we all need different ideas. It's just uh, to help people find themselves again. Yeah. You know, no, I, I used is, to, sorry, go ahead. How is it that one second humanity can blast an astronaut to the moon and the next second um, we have a soccer riot? Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? There, we have these two selves. There are these two yeah. parts of us. And right now we're, I, I think humanity is in a very defensive position. But I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. I, I you know, I just thinking about, you know, um, you know, when it comes to the like forgiving ourselves, rejecting guilt, when it comes to looking at, and you just mentioned the idea that um, we are defensive. And I feel that that's very true. And on, at the same time, when I think about, you know, this principal support, when I think about um, just the idea of um, how polarizing, how right I am versus how wrong you are, mm -hmm. um, I just, for one, I jokingly say this to some of my colleagues. I'm like, I think more people should be around people they don't that don't think the same way. Mm -hmm. I felt, there was a time where you could have constructive uh, uh, arguments, and obviously, there's this old saying: "Hurt people, hurt people." I think a lot of people are hurt, and uh, and I feel some of this certainty that's grabbing onto certain polarizing idea. At least for me, I could see how it's comfortable. It could be a little comfort blanket. You you mm -hmm. belong somewhere, even mm -hmm. though, honestly, it doesn't solve any of the problems that you're ignoring today. For me, um, when it comes to trauma, when it comes to stuff like that, it's more about letting go for me. You know, a lot of times, um, not to say I want to remember. And part of tributes is remembering, and that's mm -hmm. the whole thing because. We're so easy to forget because there's so many lessons. One mm -hmm. thing I don't like is quick fix model. Like, oh, right. once we get this, mm -hmm. I'm like, then you just negated all these lessons we learned through this whole COVID pandemic situation. Right, right. There's so many lessons that I learned personally that I don't want to forget. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, you know, before I go to the last principles report and kind of wrap things up, is this. You know, we talked about your, you know, as tensions continue to build, what ways have you seen personally that helped your own trauma? And what have you seen help your peers dealing with trauma? What have you seen that has worked? Obviously, um, some of what we discussed, but anything else you want to add or comment on? Um, and it's it's interesting. I had a discussion on Facebook about this with someone recently. Uh, mm. We moved to Missouri and uh, there's some racial tension in this area. Mm -hmm. And um, and 
the people with whom I was speak, uh, I was commun, I was communicating with, uh, they were very media savvy, I, I guess. Yeah, I say. yeah, yeah. Um, And my solution, my my answer was the same, right? Mm. Uh, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Uh, and the cycle continues. Mm. But what if you can instead find similarities again? Mm. Have you ever said something in the heat of a moment, the yeah. arguing with somebody, and later on you said, "Why did I say that? Why mm-hmm. I can't believe I said that." Mm-hmm. You know that right there are the two sides of yourself. Yeah. You know, in the heat of the moment, you weren't thinking clearly, and then once you were able to think clearly, you were able to judge that on kind of a sober level. So, what have I seen help peers uh, as the tensions mount? Uh, mm. is connecting with similarities. Yeah. Um, you know, if no matter what protests you see, one having to do with storming buildings, another one have, having to do with setting fires, no matter which one you see, they're both on some level doing what they're doing because they're trying to protect something beautiful to them. Yeah. Their family, their children, their... You know, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, so-and-so is doing such and such. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they're screwy. But yeah. no. You yeah. know, that's the defense mechanism. That's the soccer riot side of ourselves. It's not the, you know, blast an astronaut off to the moon side of ourselves. Yeah. And um, we all contain both. We yeah. all have both. So, again, how I've helped people connect is to realize that language is just language. Yeah. Uh, a uh, philosopher Wittgenstein once said that language is a powerful thing, and yet it can't even describe the aroma of coffee. Mm-hmm. So yeah. how how do we replace you know the real world that we can touch and see with language and allow it to completely drive us mm-hmm. without exposing ourselves to mm-hmm. what's true? Speak to somebody on the other side of the aisle you know, um, see what they think, what values do they hold true? And then talk about, you know, how you think those values could be upheld. And then you've got a discussion, a pro-American yeah. discussion where nobody's hurt. You yeah. don't have hurt people hurting people because everybody's triggers look different. Yeah. All based on their own pasts. So yeah. I hope I uh, answered your question. Yeah, and I feel you know um, one thing I want to add before I and uh, la- put the last one. Everyone knows we will never give up hope for Nami is a last right. one, but a very important one. I just put this up here. This is from um, Victor, uh, Victor Franco, and uh, uh, and, he, and I read his book, and I, it really inspired me. But he re- wrote this, and kind of kind of is a little undertone. He says everything can be taken from a man, but one thing. The last of human freedoms to choose one's edit in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Uh, I think so a lot of times we, we feel like we don't have a choice. Um, and I'm not minimizing that because a lot of us, I remember feeling that way too. One thing that you were saying that really, uh, you know, I went to school that was like, like you know, a lot of, it was heavy math when I went to university. And one of the things that we always did was derivatives. And I think in my feelings, I try to get to the derivative of what I feel. I will never know what you've been through, Louis, but I know how it feels to be sad. I know mm. how it feels to be alone. I know how it feels. One of my one of my friends who had been a podcast guest lost his father during Christmas Day mm. uh, on, on this past from COVID. And I just remember him saying, like, one of the quotes, I don't know where it was. I couldn't even find it, but I love it. It was haunting. It said, you know, when you lose someone, and I've lost people, and it's just like um, you have all this love, but nowhere to put it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's one of those things. So, with that being said, you know, we will never give up hope. I feel like hope mm-hmm. and purpose in recovery, whether it's PTSD, whether whatever you're dealing with, you know, what I mean, um, is tremendously important because I remember one of this one of my friends who's an alcoholic. Well, well, not. I wouldn't say that she's 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 recovering from alcoholism. She said, um, "If all it was was not to pick up a drink each day, it would have been miserable. It's not it's not sustainable just to say what we shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. We're more complex individuals than that than we like to give ourselves. We're not drones. We're not people that's 
listening and hearing or feeling connecting individuals that need each other as much as we hate to admit it we need to connect as much as right we try, yeah. right but i just want to end by asking you thank you again but final thoughts that you'd like to share with those listening um um uh louis yeah uh a couple of things uh mm -hmm. ptsd it's something I, I was diagnosed in 2013 mm -hmm. and uh it's something at least in my experience uh you live with but mm -hmm. something you manage uh mm -hmm. the symptoms will come up and they'll drop and they'll come up and they'll drop and and it's, it's just the way it goes but it is completely manageable mm -hmm. um what helps me sometimes when I feel overloaded mm -hmm. is I like to put my hand here mm -hmm. and another hand on my forehead mm -hmm. so I can remember that all this negativity goes no further than my forehead, yeah. which means all that is safe. Yeah. So since all that is safe, I take mm -hmm. my time using my senses to try to reconnect with that. Yeah. I, I use my senses. I pay attention to what I hear, what I see, what I feel. You know, and and um, I allow myself to be in this moment physically, yeah. and I think about what I've what I've just done, and then um, uh, and then I notice how that makes me feel, yeah. and it helps bring me back. Not always; it's not always <laughs> perfect. Uh, I mm -hmm. went through something recently, but uh, uh, it it usually helps bring me back to this moment, mm -hmm. and I think it's encouraging for everybody to realize that if you, no matter what's going on in your mind look around mm. right and ask yourself this question i would write this down i if i could tattoo it on myself i would <laughs> ask yourself when you're concerned what is right action when there's no physical threat to be perceived mm -hmm. once again what is right action when there's no physical threat to be perceived yeah right yeah there's a lot of urgency in this world a lot of us, a lot of things being, a lot of things being told how fast, how quick we have to respond. Mm -hmm. Take time to breathe. I, I want to say thank you again, Louis. Thank you so much. Share your insight with us today. I, I want to share those. Louis's book information will be included in the notes. And I'm going to switch over. Yeah. And I'm going to switch over and say, remember to stay updated with Rob Ministries through all its various platforms. RomishDFL.com is the website. I'm going to leave you with this one quote. His last quote. It's from, it's from Mary Ann Ratchbatcher. It says, Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is that quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. <laughs>